let's talk about electromagnetic radiation. Well, what's electromagnetic radiation, you ask? Well, for one thing, it's a form of energy. And it's a form of energy that acts as a wave as it travels. We'll talk about waves in a second. All of the different types of energy that you're mostly familiar with, things like visible light, x-ray, ultraviolet radiation, infrared light, microwaves, radio waves, gamma waves, cosmic rays, all of those fit into this category of electromagnetic radiation. They have some things in common. The first is they travel like waves. The second is they all travel at the same speed, the speed of light, which is 3.00 times 10 to the eighth meters per second in a vacuum. All of these types of radiation travel at that speed. And we can kind of take them all together and combine them into what's called the electromagnetic spectrum, which looks like this. Now, this is a very sort of classic representation of the spectrum. This one happens to be arranged, the different types of radiation are arranged by something called wavelength, which we're going to get to in just a second. Uh, wavelength is measured in meters. It is, in fact, a distance. And this particular spectrum is arranged from the very shortest wavelengths on the left to the very longest wavelengths on the right. We start over here on the left, the very, very left edge, smallest wavelengths, something called gamma rays. Okay. Then as we get a little bit longer, we move uh, just to the right of that, and we have x-rays. And then we have ultraviolet rays. And all of these wavelengths are very, very small. We're talking on order of 10 to the minus 12th, all the way up to maybe 10 to the minus 8th. 10 to the minus 12th is a trillionth of a meter. Very, very small wavelengths. Once we get to 4 times 10 to the minus 7th meters, we reach an area of the spectrum that our eyes have evolved to be sensitive to. And we call that the visible light spectrum. It is pretty much stuck right in there from 4 times 10 to the minus 7th meters all the way up to 7 times 10 to the minus 7th meters. It's not a very large range. And there's nothing particularly unique about this section of the spectrum. It's just that this is the only part of the spectrum that our eyes are sensitive to. There are creatures whose eyes are sensitive to different portions of the spectrum. Some insects can see into the ultraviolet range, for example. Some, can, some uh, reptiles can see into the infrared portion of the spectrum, which is just to the right of that. Beyond visible light, we have infrared. Microwaves, which are probably the most important radiation in your daily life. And we're not just talking about microwave ovens. We're talking about things like cell phones, GPS units, wireless microphones. All of those things occupy the microwave section of the spectrum. So your cell phone, when you make a call, all of the energy, all of the information is being sent at a very particular wavelength right in the microwave region. Not the same wavelength that you might cook something with in your microwave oven, but in that same general area of the spectrum. And then finally down the end we have radio waves. And they're the longest wavelengths. We'll talk later about how the length of the wave, the wavelength, uh, affects how these things travel. But for now, just take a look at the spectrum and realize that visible light, what you see, is part of that. And it's uh, no different from any of these other types of, of energy except that we can't see those other types of energy. So a wave, when we talk about a wave, we mean this sort of oscillation. It's called a sine wave. And it kind of goes up and down and, and it travels. And we're moving through space. We're, we're actually traveling from one place to another. Two parts of the wave that you should be familiar with. One is called the amplitude. The amplitude is the height of the wave. It sounds like amplify. When you're dealing with sound, if you increase the height of the sound waves, you make the sound louder. That's what amplify means. In the terms of electromagnetic radiation, if you increase the height of the wave, you make the energy more intense. Now, in visible light intensity, we say bright. It's brighter. But we don't use the word bright for things like x-rays or ultraviolet radiation. We talk about being intense. So increase in amplitude means more intense radiation. The second measurement is that thing called wavelength again. And you'll see there's this sort of red line showing uh, that it's the distance between two points on waves that are right next to each other. As a matter of fact, that's the definition that we typically use for wavelength. 
wavelength is represented by the Greek letter lambda, which looks sort of like an upside down Y, but is really the Greek letter L, L for length. And it's the distance between two identical points on two adjacent waves, waves right next to each other. Usually people say the top of the wave to the top of the next wave, but it doesn't have to be that. Any two equivalent points on two adjacent waves is the wavelength, and it's the same distance between those waves. It's measured in meters because meter is the SI standard unit for length, but usually these wavelengths, especially visible light right around there, very, very small, small, small distances, 10 to the minus 10th, 10 to the minus 8th, 10 to the minus 7th. So it's usually better or easier to talk about wavelength in nanometers. And remember that a nanometer is about a billionth of a meter, or 10 to, the, 10 to the 9th nanometers is equal to 1 meter. You should become very comfortable, if you're not already, with converting between meters and nanometers because you're going to have to do that. Nanometers is how you'll probably get the information, but you'll need to convert it to meters in order to use it in any calculation. Uh, the third property, so we have amplitude, wavelength, and finally frequency. And frequency is defined as the number of waves that pass a point in one second. Uh, it's represented by the Greek letter ni. Now, I know that looks like it says nu, but I have it on good authority from several native Greek speakers that that is actually pronounced ni. That's the name of the letter. It's the Greek letter n. And it's the number of waves that pass a point in a second. The unit is typically 1 over seconds, or cycles per second, or more commonly, hertz. Hertz was a gentleman's name who came up with this particular unit. So one hertz is one cycle per second, or one over seconds. The wavelength of a wave and the frequency of that wave are inversely proportional. Inversely proportional meaning one goes up, the other one goes down. The proportion that relates them is the speed of light, 3.00 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, which is represented by the letter C. So we have this nice simple to use equation. C is equal to lambda times ni wavelength times frequency. Wavelength in meters, frequency in hertz or 1 over seconds, speed of light C in meters over seconds. So you see speed of light has meters, that's why wavelength has to have meters. All you need is either the wavelength or the frequency and you can solve for the other one. When we talk about inverse proportional what we mean is this. Take a look at these three waves. The top wave, the red wave, has four complete waves traveling past the same point in one second. Or within that double-headed arrow at the top that represents one second of time, we get four waves that fit in there. That's four cycles per second or four hertz. The wavelength of that particular wave we call lambda one. Now, look at what happens in the second wave. In the second wave, we have twice as many, the green one in the middle. The second wave has twice as many waves passing the same point or fitting into the same amount of time. So we've doubled the frequency. It is now 8 cycles per second, or 8 hertz. But look at what happened to the wavelength. It's half of wavelength number 1, lambda 1. Lambda 2 is half of that. If we double the frequency again to the blue wave at the bottom, we've got 16 cycles per second. Our wavelength gets even smaller. It's half of what it was in lambda 2. So that's what we mean by inversely proportional. As wavelength gets smaller, frequency has to be getting faster. Prior to 1900, energy was energy, matter was matter, and never the two should meet. Matter was made of particles, it had mass, you could see those particles, you could figure out where their positions were. Energy was waves, it didn't have mass, it was delocalized, and, and that was the way it was. If you wanted to talk about energy, you had to talk about it in terms of waves and things like we just talked about, but matter was talked about in terms of particles. This is where we start to merge into things that we've already studied. Now the first person to come along and start working on this, or one of the first, was a guy by the name of Max Planck. Planck was a German physicist and he suggested that atoms can emit energy. And when they give off energy or take in energy, they do it in little packets called quanta. A quantum is the minimum, the smallest amount of energy that can be gained or lost by an atom. And so he said energy is sort of given off in these little packets, or it's taken in in these little packets called quanta. And he reasoned that the energy 
of these particular quanta is related to the frequency. So the greater the frequency of the energy, of the, the more energy that's going to have. And they were proportional directly by this constant called Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34th joules, which is the measurement for energy, per second, or time second, so joules per hertz. Well, we now have uh, the ability to kind of relate a couple of things we've already seen here. So we have our relationship between lambda and mu, wavelength and frequency. They're inversely proportional by C. If we rearrange that to solve for frequency, we have frequency is equal to C over wavelength, speed of light over the wavelength. And we just saw Planck's equation, which is the energy of these quanta is equal to or proportional to the frequency, uh, h times mi, h being Planck's constant. If we substitute in frequency c over lambda in for the frequency in the second equation, we get this combined equation. And so we have a relationship between the energy of, of a wave, the energy of these quanta, and the wavelength. Well, think about what this implies. If these little packets are called quanta, packets of energy sounds like particles, but now we've just related it to waves. So now we're starting to get someplace here. The units are important, and to remind you, wavelength has to be measured in meters to do these calculations because the speed of light is in meters per second. So wavelength's got to be in meters. You may have to do a conversion. Frequency is in 1 over seconds or seconds to the minus 1 or hertz. Energy is measured in joules, that's the SI unit for energy, speed of light in meters per second, Planck's constant in joules per hertz or joules times seconds. As long as you keep your units consistent and you make sure you're in the right unit, these calculations are very simple. You may recognize this guy with the wild hair, that's Albert Einstein. And Einstein took it to the next level. He said radiation, energy itself, is really just particles. And he called those particles photons from the Greek word for light. Since we know the energy of a photon is equivalent to h times ni, Planck's constant times frequency, which is the same as h times c over lambda, we just saw that in the previous slide, we have a relationship now between waves and particles. And Einstein went further with his theory of relativity, and he showed that energy actually has mass by that very famous equation e equals mc squared. So after 1900, these gentlemen started working on this concept of the fact that matter and energy are the same. Louis de Broglie, French chemist, 1924, he said, I'll tell you something even more. Not only are waves and particles ways that you can talk about matter, but in fact, matter has both characteristics of waves and characteristics of particles. He called this the wave-particle duality. And what it means is that depending on how much mass you have, you might behave more like a particle or less like a particle and more like a wave. So the main ideas here that we have are that matter and energy are not distinct. They're actually the same thing. Energy is just a form of matter. Larger objects behave more like particles. Smaller objects, like electrons, behave mostly like waves. And that's a really important distinction and a very important part of where we're going next. So, watch the video, rewatch it, take some notes, and don't forget to answer the questions down below when you're done. Who are you? We are the knights who say... Nee. No, not the knights who say... Nee. The same!